Hello students, welcome back to another episode of Principles of Micro. We finished talking about market basics last time. Now let's move on to talk about demand. So we talked about where the demand curve comes from back in chapter 16. We had that rule that consumers follow to find their best consumption, that is their optimal consumption. They want to have the marginal utility per dollar be equal for all goods. So once consumers do that, it's going to generate a demand curve. It's going to tell them, it's going to say how much they would buy at any given price. So perhaps this consumer would buy nothing if the price were $2. They'd say it's too expensive. If the price went down to $1, they'd buy two units. For free, they would take four. So you could graph that as well. So here is price of two, quantity of zero. And here is price of one, quantity of two, that corresponds to this point. Price of zero, quantity of four, there's going to be this point in the graph. So you just join those three points of the line, and there's your demand curve. So your book's terminology is a little bit idiosyncratic here. It calls the table a demand schedule, and it calls this a demand curve, and treats them as being very different. A lot of books out there will just use the word demand to refer to both of them. So don't worry a whole lot about that distinction. This graph and this table are showing you the same information. So in my example, the quiet demanded always went down whenever price went up. That was not just random chance. That was designed intentionally to follow something called the law of demand. The law of demand is a very, very big deal. You'll hear about that not just in this course many, many times, but also in every econ class you take. So listen up. This is huge. So law of demand says that all else equal, when the price gets bigger, quiet demand is going to go down. So you should see this negative relationship between price and quantity. Remember, P is price and Q is quantity. We're using QD to indicate quantity demanded. <coughs> this might be the first time you've heard about the law of demand. Nevertheless, it has actually been influencing you for your whole life. You've probably said something or heard someone say something like these following phrases. That's on sale, so I'm buying extra. So it's saying, when price goes down, I'm going to start buying more. That's the law of demand. If the landlord makes the rent more expensive, that means price is going up, you're going to start demanding less. You might not renew your lease, whereas if the rent stayed the same, maybe you would have renewed your lease. So the quantity you're going to demand from the landlord is going to go down when they raise the rent. Or, um, this slide was obviously not written very recently. Gas is too expensive now. It's actually pretty cheap these days. But when I wrote the slide, gas is too expensive. So people respond to that by driving less and they might take the bus more often. So when the price of gas goes up, people start buying less gas. So even things like gas or wire, which you might think of as being necessities, they also respond to price. Demand for gas is not fixed. And likewise, demand for water also not fixed. People can adapt to changes in price. All right, so here's a question for you guys to think about. I have four graphs up here showing possible relationships between price and quantity. For each one, figure out if it follows the law of demand or if it violates the law of demand. Go ahead and pause the video here and think about that. And when you're ready, press play.
All right, I'll assume you have worked out the answers. So for our first graph, graph A, whenever price goes up, quantity demanded also goes up. That can't be right. So A is violating the law of demand. For graph B, whenever price goes up, quantity demanded is going down. That follows the law of demand, so that's okay. Graph C, whenever price goes up, quantity demand is going to fall. That sounds right. So graph C is nonlinear, but that's okay. The law of demand just says when price goes up, quantity demand it goes down. The law of demand does not imply that the relationship has to be linear. So curves are okay. All right, last graph, graph D. So at first, when price goes up, quiet demand falls. However, over here, when price goes up, quiet demanded rises. So that part of the graph violates the law of demand. So overall, this whole thing violates the law of demand. So if there's one part of the graph that is inconsistent with the law of demand, then you got to throw out the whole thing. So graph D is in violation. There's no middle ground here. You can't say, well, part of it follows the law of demand, part of it doesn't, so it's partly okay. The whole graph has to follow the law of demand in order to satisfy the law of demand. Quiet demand should always go down, unless it's already at zero, whenever price goes up. So we see that graphs B and C follow the law of demand, but graphs A and D violate it. So that's how individual demand curves work. There is also what's called the market demand or the aggregate demand. So that comes from just adding together the individual demand curves. So when price is two, let's say Jane is gonna buy zero units and Dan also buys zero units. So if Jane buys zero and Dan also buys zero, the total being bought here is also zero. So market demand is Q equals zero. When the price is one, Jane is gonna buy two and Dan is gonna buy three. That means that the total amount being bought, the market demand is gonna be five. Similarly, if the price is zero, Jane's gonna buy four and Dan is gonna buy six, market demand, total demand is gonna be six plus four, which is 10. So you can see how this is constructed. So that's how you add together that the bank curves and the tables. You can also add the curves together graphically. So we said for Jane, she bought zero when the price was two and she bought one Sorry, she, brought, she bought two and the price is one and four and price is zero. So this curve represents Jane's demand. And here is Dan. So Dan bought zero and the price was two. He buys three when price is one and six when price is zero. So you just add point by point. So price is two, Jane buys zero, Dan buys zero. So market demand is zero. And price is one, Jane bought two, and Dan bought three. So you sum those distances together, you get five, which is the market demand. Lastly, when price is zero, Jane buys four, and Dan buys six. We add those distances together, you get 10, and there is your market demand. Market demand can be kinked. This happens when there is a situation where not everyone is buying. So down here, I modified our previous example a little bit. Jane's demand curve is still the same. She still buys zero when the price is two and two when the price is one. Dan, however, is now going to buy one 
when the price is 2 and by 0 when the price is 3. So for this top portion of the market demand, when price is between 2 and 3, Dan is the only one buying. So that means for this range of prices, market demand is Dan's demand. So you can see this part of the demand curve is the same. Now once price falls below 2, then Jane is going to enter the market and start buying stuff. That means that market demand becomes both Jane's demand plus Dan's. So when the price is 2, Jane buys 0 and Dan buys 1, so market demand is 1. When price is 1, Jane buys 2 and Dan also buys 2, so market demand is 2 plus 2 which is 4, which gives us that point. When price is 0, Jane buys 4 and Dan buys 3, so the total is 7. So that gives us the last point on the market demand curve. So for this lower portion, both Jane and Dan are buying, so that gives you this slope over here. For the upper portion, only Dan buys, so it has the same slope as Dan's demand curve. It gives you this kink where the slope changes once Jane starts buying. So that is how the demand curve works. Be sure to come tune in for our next episode in which we'll see when does the demand curve shift when things in the market change.